So who's, who's leading, you oh, or me? I'm sorry. Today? Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, uh, the, 20, the 31st. Something. Holy moly. 31st. No, the 18th. 18th. Is oh, me 31. Uh, you're going to confuse <laughs> me. The last of the 2018 uh, Digital Rebar Meetups. Uh, we have um, quite a bit of material to cover for this because we're, we're going to do retrospectives and then talk roadmaps because um, we've been we've been dusting that we, we dusted off the 2019 roadmap um, because we had some requests uh, and so we thought we would present that but I think before we do that we're going to um, talk through uh, what we what we've done um, and then we had some back we had something we didn't cover last time which was cubevert which I, I, I'm going to truncate um, and machine controller, which we're going to, I guess we're going to end up holding, but I'll, I'll describe. Oh, we had a video. Super secret. I, I didn't publish this video widely, but um, let me, let me find it and I'll put the thing, put it in there. Whoops. Shane, I lost your, your, your uh, screen from that perspective. What'd you do with it? There it is. Now it's back. I couldn't see it. Uh, I guess when I switch away on my virtual console, it goes away. Yeah, I think it does. I think that's the. Uh, huh. Sorry, I say I'm just looking for a link to put something in here about this machine controller. Um, okay. Well, while you while you're poking around for links there. Go ahead. Uh, KubeVert is super cool because it allows us to spin up and manage VMs using Kubernetes as a control plane. And we've enhanced the crib content. For those of you not familiar with that, that's our Kubernetes rebar, uh, what do we call I? Not immutable anymore. Infrastructure. Uh, integrated, integrated. Integrated. There we go. Integrated bootstrap process. So <laughs> our Kubernetes workflow process has now gained some additional legs in addition to all of the cool things, uh, it now supports KubeVert uh, for VM management um, and command and control. And Rob, you did most of that work, I think, right? Uh, yeah, I did. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it, KubeVert just basically runs KVM as a, from kubectl commands. And so the power here is that it's integrated in as a cube cuddle, which is the control co command line controller for kubevert. And so you can stop and start uh, VMs. And then the other thing that's cool is it uses, um, because of that, it uses Docker uh, hub registry as the uh, VM image deployment piece. Um, so we, we are pretty excited about this as a way to deploy VMs inside of Kubernetes rather than having to put a separate virtualization layer. Um, yeah, and, and we're skeptical about OpenStack. Um, say that again, since I'm on tape, we're skeptical about OpenStack um, getting the control plane simple enough um, for the use cases that we, we see. Um, and so this seems like a really good, really good way to um, get VMs if you need VMs. Um, and our crib stuff keeps just getting more and more solid. Um, so we're pretty excited about that in general. So this is just a nice add. So all you have to do to make this work is you drop a stage into your crib workflow and it'll install, uh, install uh, Kubevert. There's still lots of work for them to do. This isn't, you know, it's not as mature as, as you know, we'll ultimately expect it to be, but Red Hat's got like 20 engineers working on it and there's a couple other companies too. So, uh, I was, I think there are almost, they've almost got as many people working on that as they have on their OpenStack stuff at this point. So you can, you be the judge where things are going to turn out. Um, of course, IBM is going to come in and who knows. Um, <laughs> so watch the video. The video actually shows me booting VMs using uh, Kubevert. It, I do the install and it's super fast. It's really easy. So that's that. Um, not trying to belabor the point. Any questions before I jump off? I think it's mostly us and Bo. Nope, we got a couple. No, it's us and Bo. 
Um, it probably, both for the Cable Labs team, it probably matters uh, at some point this, because I know you all are big OpenStack people. You might not love my denigration of OpenStack, but uh, this should be this should be on your radar. Okay, and then machine controller is uh, this video. We didn't post this in com in the community channel yet. Um, uh, we went to some selected audiences because we're still trying to figure out. Um, you know, one, it's the holidays, and two, we're we're trying to figure out how how far this goes um, as before it becomes more widely public. Um, but the the in that video we have there's a there's um, it's a company called LoadC that has this open source uh, machine controller, which is a kube cuddle uh, API extension. So you can go in and in Kubernetes. Uh, you can work with machines as an API extension, and then it will use the rebar APIs to create or allocate machines for Kubernetes to use and put them in a workflow that joins clusters in Kubernetes. Uh, <laughs> which sounds a little circular, and it is. Um, but the idea well, here is that it's yep. actually not circular, though, because it allows you to dynamically scale up and scale down clusters of bare metal. Correct which is super, super cool. Right, so Kubernetes becomes the control point for expanding or collapsing a cluster, which is what the Kubernetes cluster API people are doing. Um, and they're using that to spin up Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft clusters. The pattern we're using would allow you to use DRP as the machine source. And this integration literally says I can expand or contract or dynamically roll and upgrade a cluster using those mechanisms and using digital rebar to workflows to um, in, inject or decrement the, um, the cluster size. And so that uses Racken's pooling API or will use Racken's pooling API behind the scenes as part of that. The other thing to note in that, which is actually a whole other topic, um, because this surface, I think in the general general consumption of the libraries is that we added a um, cloud init stage. So if you want to use cloud init, we actually now have a stage that will drive cloud init uh, integrations um, as a generic feature of digital rebar. Uh, that actually is, should be its, its own topic for 2019, Shane. Because this is generic, it's, it's really powerful stuff. So. Um, so one of the other use cases I was just thinking about the machine controller that is uh, quite relevant today is edge or small deployment, multiple small deployment locations and being able to spin up and control hardware uh, from Kub Kubernetes, DRP, crib content and manage multiple Kubernetes clusters in, a, in essence, sort of a um, federated control plane. That, and that's actually what Lutzi does. So Lutzi's um, specialty is a federated control plane for Kubernetes, a multi-cluster multi federated control plane. Talk about all the buzzwords. Um, <laughs> Throw some IoT and uh, blockchain in there too. IoT, hybrid, multi-cloud, brokerage. Um, <laughs> yeah, bingo. But um, the, the neat thing here is that, yeah, you can use their cluster management tooling um, to build your clusters on top of the infrastructure. So you still might bootstrap the first cluster with crib, um, or you could just use crib natively because it supports a lot of those things too. But let's see, has some advantages like um, multi-tenancy um, service, they have some service provider capabilities. And if you're trying to manage a whole bunch of clusters at different versions, that's what they're trying to do. So. Awesome. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. It's nice, it's nice to see the collaboration too. I'm, I'm more excited for this to be a, I, I think people are going to want to control their control rebar through Kubernetes uh, to the extent that they have self-service portals. It makes a lot of sense. Did we do a, a meet? Yeah, we did a meetup on pooling. So people should go if they're wondering what pooling is. Yes. Uh, five meetups ago, we did a full, full, 
uh, meetup. Uh, I don't think it was that far back, but yeah, somewhere back there. No, you might be right. It, it was a couple back. Um, yeah. There's some UX support for it, and it's about to get better. I hope. Hope we're going to put a little bit of UX time in there. At least different. At least different. <laughs> That's right, because the pooling is part of what prompted us to do the um, object extensions work, where you can extend the API with custom objects that we talked about last time. So much stuff. Greg, did you have anything to add on machine controller? That was your baby. No, that's good. You're fine. Uh, I'm going to throw cloud init into the uh, backlog, because I think that that is a topic of itself for next year. And then, okay. Wow, Shane, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of, of stuff you have in this uh, retrospect. Yeah, so it, it, in the, re yeah, so I guess moving on to the 2018 retrospective, we had a lot of action. Um, some of it was incremental small changes, but a lot of those incremental small changes were taking the existing capabilities and foundation that we've laid in and enhancing them such a, in such a manner that it was a much stronger foundation. And we made a, a comment earlier in uh, the meetup today, I'm not sure if we got it on tape, but um, there was a lot of foundational work that got put in in the first half of the year, which weren't necessarily all great big huge features, but they provided a lot of the core foundation, which the second half of the year we built a lot of pretty cool features on top of and have started to really expand and enhance the capabilities overall. Uh, starting the first release uh, starting in uh, 2018 was V360 on January 22nd. Uh, some minor uh, enhancements there, uh, Isolus installs and logging system enhancements. The logging system mm -hmm. enhancements were pretty important just in general for helping surface uh, a lot of the uh, things that are happening in the back end and debugging as you're building and working and operating things. Uh, February 22nd, we released 3.7.0, uh, a lot of DHC enhancements. In fact, you'll see throughout the year, through a lot of the features, there's been a lot of uh, IPIXI, UEFI, uh, DHCP enhancements that have been slowly adding in, which have um, been really beefing up uh, the DHCP service capabilities within DRP and bringing it um, not necessarily to parity with some of the other larger, you know, more focused DHCP services, but um, really laser focusing on the operational needs and requirements for DHCP. The beautiful thing about the DRP DHCP service is it's super clean API front end uh, capabilities. So you can have really nice control and API over in control over your DHCP services, which are pretty hard to find out there in the world today. And we're also only really implementing the stuff that's mostly uh, used by customers as opposed to 6 million options and configurable tweaks and variables and things that most people don't need, which creates a, a bloated DHCP service. So it's pretty high speed, low drag. Uh, one of the major, major features added in in 3.7.0 is Plugin V2. It was a rework for the plugin system that Greg uh, took on and really enhanced the capability, stability, and reliability of the plugin subsystem in 3.7.0. Um, some changes to go high, uh, operational changes in a number of components and pieces. Uh, 371, 372, 373 uh, all came out relatively quickly from February 26th to February 3rd. Mostly those are bug fixes, though we did add the magic iPixie support, as I call it, which is, um, I think Victor did most of the work on that, uh, if I recall correctly, being able to just ident the Pixie request coming in and quote unquote, do the right thing and adding a lot of helpers to make the um, DHCP Pixie process a lot more clean and require a lot less lift up front for people to get up and, and working. Uh, April 12th, 380, uh, Workflows V2. This is another one of the major kind of foundational components that is really the backbone of a lot of the capabilities that exist in DRP uh, today. Originally, we had the old uh, style for managing workflows that was sort of uh, added in um, 
through uh, parameter uh, manipulation that was quite hard to sort of get right and had a lot of sort of side effects to it. Um, Greg, I think, did the majority of the work. I'm, I'm not sure, Victor, if you had some hand in Workflows V2. I'm guessing you probably did. Um, but Workflows V2 is huge enhancement. It brought Workflows in as a first-class citizen and really stabilized the flow and the control of Workflows. Uh, it's also where we started adding in another one of the major themes in 2018 is multi-OS and multi-architecture support. Uh, so there are a lot of refactoring and DRP CLI to support both workflows and multi-OS, multi-art support, Windows getting a lot of enhancements with DRP CLI. We'll see further on uh, some additions to things uh, like PowerShell and Windows Magic support as well. Um, contents upload helpers, uh, a lot of the the CLI gets a lot of enhancements throughout the year to make uh, manipulating and managing content uh, much better. One of the other things was uh, range headers and asynchronous job logging, uh, which allows for much better uh, performance on the DRP C uh, endpoint. One of the problems we had, because we logged so much synchronously, it was causing performance issues. So there's a bit of asynchronous log job logging in there. Uh, which has significantly improved performance of DRP under significant load environments. Uh, April 30th, uh, version 3.8.1, mostly bug fitch, fix 3.8.1 and 3.8.2, but we also had a couple of enhancements, uh, some enhancements to the plugins, uh, some fast downloaders to the install, and rendering helpers added in 3.8.2 uh, to help with uh, rendering uh, boot ems and templates. Uh, 3.9.0 is a pretty big feature on June 22nd as well. This is where uh, Victor had, we locked Victor up in a small closet and we um, dropped uh, chocolate chip cookies and, um, you know, sugary drinks in through the door every occasionally and he produced uh, RBAC capabilities. RBAC is a foundational uh, part of our enterprise features as Rob is adding in there currently. Uh, secure parameters as well was added in. Uh, which allows us to uh, support encrypted parameters so that we can pass parameters back and forth uh, in content and, and across the wire so that they're encrypted and protected. Um, there were some up significant updates to package repositories as well. So being able to add support for custom repositories um, and mirrors, PowerShell command I mentioned previously, uh, and then Greg added in some simple, uh, highly availability, high availability features to DRP, uh, which is also a lot of the second half of the year. There's been some um, growing work around the HA DRP stuff, and I think we'll see in the 2019 roadmap a lot of continuation of that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Slim Objects uh, provides uh, uh, performance enhancements when you're doing a, a, a get of objects. Uh, the machine objects would carry the go high inventory, which have very large blocks of JSON information. And if you didn't need that and you're requesting a lot of machine inventory data, it would cause a significant amount of packet size and, and performance problems. So Slim Objects allows you to slim down that uh, uh, object data, essentially, to request smaller chunks of object data that are only the pieces that you really need to see as opposed to the entire blob uh, was a performance problem for some of the customers in the field. Um, one of the really cool things that got added in at this point also is uh, uh, content packages get dynamic doc capability. So this was the beginning of us starting to add documentation uh, directly into contents. And so content packages, when they're built now, uh, dynamically generate docs, which are uh, visible in our read the docs pages. Uh, there are a number of uh, content packages that still need to be retrofitted with that. Some of the stuff that existed prior to this happening, but you'll see some of the newer things like crib particularly has really good documentation and uh, Greg has gone back and added IPMI documentation for the IPMI plugin, etc. cetera. Uh, so those were uh, great as well. Um, and then, uh, We've added in licensing for select plugins for trials uh, in that point as well uh, in 3.9.0, yes. Yeah. Um, and then we started 
shifting into the second half. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. I was just going to say there were there were a lot of things that people wanted to play with that we didn't have a good way for le to let people try. And with the plug exactly. licensing, it, it really makes it makes much more of our, and we're about to talk about making the library even more available. From that perspective. Yep, exactly. Uh, and then we kind of shift into the second half of the year where we start kind of building on a lot of, there's still a little um, foundational work obviously always going on, uh, but we really start shifting into building some of the, the that bigger feature capabilities in there. Um, starting August 2nd, we have uh, V310 uh, where we start adding the multi OS support and tasks. So a single task can actually have task, task related uh, uh, information for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. And so you can maintain one single task for multiple OSs. But in the past, you'd have to identify a specific OS within your task and then call out to do something else for that uh, OS specifically. So this just streamlines the multiple multi-OS support as well. Uh, again, more enhancements to DHCP, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, throughout the year, the lots of tweaks and tune-ups and additional support. In this case, Comboot uh, gets added in. Uh, Greg added in a, a slash metrics uh, end, API endpoint uh, on the DRP endpoint as well. So now that Prometheus metrics can be bubbled up directly from uh, DRP internally. So you can see all of the internal workings of DRP and profiling of the performance of it. Uh, Event Watcher, one of the other big pieces added in as well uh, with Sprig templates, this really spruces up the uh, templating library to add a bunch of features and capabilities and, and enhancements to be able to do much more complex and smart things uh, more easily within the Golang templating uh, for templates themselves. This is a lot of stuff. It's huge, and I'm trying. Some of the, the I'm I'm if if you're watching my my notes, I keep adding these sort of themes that um, are themes, but at the same time, it's, um, it, it's not like there stuff leaked across boundaries. Like we had stuff that was preliminary, like, it, but then didn't, didn't do it. Like this, this release in a lot of ways was a hardening release, right? Um, yeah, uh, which is a V311, September 13th. Uh, that release added uh, KXX support, uh, which is, allows extremely fast boot and provisioning cycles uh, to go from sledgehammer to boot M, boot M to sledgehammer transitions without reboot of the physical hardware. So environments that are sensitive to deploying quickly, uh, we now support KXEC for a limited subset of Linux platforms. Uh, we also added in Apple boot or BSDP uh, protocol support, uh, boot server discovery protocol and Apple thing uh, which gives us network installs for Mac systems. So if you are trying to deploy Apple hardware and, and environments, uh, as we've had some of our customers needing to do, uh, that's now supported natively in DRP. Uh, and again, more DHCP, uh, Mac reuse with reservation subnet enhancements. Uh, in continuing the multi-star sort of capabilities uh, from some of the earlier foundational work that we sort of discussed in the early half of the year, uh, multi-arch support was added in 3.12, uh, which was our most recent release that came out yesterday. Uh, we had a pretty big jump between 3.11 and 3.12 from September to December, uh, which is uh, typically we don't have that long a cycle in between uh, releases, as you see through the year. Uh, but we had a lot that went into it. Uh, in this case, the multi-arch support, it seems like it's been there forever <laughs> in terms of DRP time, but that's been in tip. Uh, so now it's finally in stable. Uh, so now you, we support uh, uh, ARM and uh, Intel-based uh, uh, architectures natively, as well as being able to add in other architecture support if we need to going forward much more easily. So that's all plumbed in uh, throughout the system. Um, uh, plug -in op we added plug-in objects, so objects now get the ability to extend the API and add storage, uh, i.e. store params and information as part of the plugin. So plugins will start to get even more smart, and I think this is another significant change that you'll see in 2019 as we've enhanced this capability within the core platform. We're going to start seeing really interesting use cases for this going forward. 
uh, bundleize and convert was added to DRP CLI to support taking existing objects within a DRP endpoint and pulling them out of DRP. Our normal pattern before had been to take create bundles and push them into as either a create or an update mechanism. We can now pull stuff out of DRP. And that's a benefit, um, particularly in sort of dev environments uh, where you need to, where you're playing around with content, you're using the UX to model or create things, or you clone things and you want to create new things and play with it. At the end of the day, you want to turn that into a content pack. You had, we're kind of left to your own devices to do that. So now we have support for that as well as being able to pull out machine objects and turn a machine object set into a referenceable content pack. So if you want to do something like backups or you want to move machines between DRP endpoints, there's sort of a number of use cases for that. Uh, lots of Docker file updates and enhancements. So the uh, Docker image gets slimmed down significantly and a lot of uh, high speed, low drag sort of capabilities added into the Docker support. We've had a lot of um, community and customers playing with the Docker uh, file and the Docker uh, uh, Dockerized version of DRP, so we've seen a lot of enhancements in there. Uh, profiles and plugins, uh, better lookup support uh, added in, some sort of more operational tooling in there. Uh, EFI and Grub2 template support enhancements. Uh, actions can now be run on behalf of machines. Go ahead. No, it's just a ton of stuff. Yep. Uh, yeah, actions some, and some of these, they, they sound like, oh yeah, this is. These are, they're huge capabilities. Uh, yeah, actions on behalf of machines is a big, big deal. We'll be able to start to see a lot more smart interaction uh, with workflows as machines can inject actions back into task lists and do right. some other interesting well, things. Well, and you can have actions that don't require the machine to be on is the one of the, exactly. big, the big things here. And- uh, Or even be a machine. <laughs> go ahead. No, that's fine. That was my comment. And then the Chiroot capabilities added. So runner Chiroot. So this is a big deal for um, environments, particularly where we're adding and prepping support for uh, the new uh, image deploy capabilities that are still in the wings in the background. Uh, the name of that product is Icon. Uh, Icon uh, will be the next generation of image deploy. This is sort of a, a significant preparation for that, where we can do things within the Chiroot environment. Uh, and it's now accessible to workflow to be able to manipulate uh, images within Chiru. I'm not sure if there are any other capabilities that'll fall out from that. It'll be interesting to see, um, but that's, I think, the primary use case for that. Uh, some cleanup, again, uh, like I said, DHCP gets more enhancements throughout the year. Uh, and we now cleaned up, uh, instead of passing binary options that we don't necessarily support directly, you can pass sort of a unsupported features through to the DHCP service. Uh, previously, that was a binary string as a real mess to be able to do. And we've, uh, Greg has enhanced that to do string colon string value pair, which makes it much cleaner and simpler uh, to extend uh, DHCP option handling into the DHCP services. Uh, licensing, go ahead. And that, that, was, that was one of the, there's a set of features that was one of them that was necessary for switch the, the in switch provisioning that's going on. Exactly, because switches do a lot of weird things with uh, the options to do switch provisioning support, um, which I didn't actually, I, well, I added it in contents, but uh, that was a big thing recently uh, through community interaction and, and Greg working on Cumulus Linux. Uh, we are now provisioning Cumulus Linux via C ZTP, zero touch provisioning. So, uh, that's really interesting piece. One of the other things is added in contents, which is a really big piece as well as the join up shell script, which allows us to enroll things into DRP, uh, switches, virtual machines, containers, uh, existing IE brownfield servers, et cetera, now start getting much better support for uh, enrolling them as objects to uh, manage and manipulate in DRP through the join up. Uh, process. Um, last in the release was enhanced licensing capabilities for a, uh, all, all you can eat sort of licensing and some, some interesting licensing things we're doing to help extend and make uh, advanced features available uh, in for more general use cases. Uh, that was all uh, DRP itself. Uh, 
content's got a lot of work throughout the year as well. I didn't break this down by version numbers. I didn't think this was going to be as big. Uh, but there are a lot of really big things that got added in. Uh, I'm, one of I'm, the things I'm thinking I might collapse the crib stuff altogether, but yeah, it, it could use some cleanup in general. Um, I, I, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Like, wow, well, just give me a second. You want to talk about yep, it in general? And do I'll... the work on that. I'll talk about some of the major pieces here. Some of the major pieces were crib, which is the Kubernetes uh, rebar uh, integrated bootstrap process. I got the I right that time. Uh, which is using the Kube Atom pattern, uh, very heavily worked on throughout the year. A lot of capabilities and features added in there. Uh, a lot of cool things added in there. Uh, Rob added, uh, Crib was a lot of um, collaborative effort between uh, Greg, uh, Rob, and myself primarily, I think. I'm not sure, Victor, if you had any hand in some of the, the Crib workflow uh, content stuff. I'm, I'm imagining you must have. We've all kind of touched it. Um, Classifier content? Nope, never touched crib. Never touched, all right, stay away from that crap. <laughs> Practically the only thing I didn't touch, but yeah, never touched crib. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, classifier content is really interesting because it allows us to uh, apply classification to machines and then dynamically do specific workflow on dependent on the results of that classification. So some of the things you can classify on or subnet or MAC address or various other elements that can be added in there and, and dynamically extended. So you can do interesting things when a, an unknown machine boots up and you can dynamically do the right things, whatever that happens to be. Uh, there was a lot of enhancement supports for Dell uh, in a number of components of uh, RAID, BIOS, Flash, Dell support capability. Uh, and it looks like I think we added the Ansible stuff early in the year. So Ansible was added early in the year, I believe which allowed us to the oh, first this is, Kubernetes this is, play. Th this is the Ansible dynamic inventory, yeah, is what you're, is what you're describing. With mm, well, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I guess so, because the yeah, Kube Spray stuff builds, was in previous to that. Yeah, so the Ansible support builds a um, set of profiles that then make it easier to, to export, to do a dynamic uh, Ansible run. Exactly. It's, it's, okay. Ansible support could mean a lot of things because we added Tower um, which uh, we have a plugin for Tower that came in um, in this release. Reckoned it. Um, but this, this is actually Ansible Dynamic Inventory Builder um, from Profiles. That's what that, that ends up being. There's some, the reason I'm saying this is there's some people who've wanted us to be able to run, which I think we have parts of, but haven't productized, um, run an Ansible playbook in a stage. Um, so that we, that like a local, run local. I haven't done that yet. Okay. Um, moving along. Um, Let's see, there are a number of sort of smaller things that still need some spit and polish, but things like Image Builder, uh, I didn't list this in here, DRP Promon, so DRP can deploy DRP itself with embedded Prometheus monitoring and uh, Grafana stuff uh, for profiling and performance testing uh, sort of reasons, and as well as deploying multiple DRP endpoints. Uh, task library was really beefed up. Uh, sane exit codes were added in, which really cleaned up a lot of the workflow handling stuff. We're finding a lot of customers kind of play around with exit code manipulation. And then when we point out the sane exit codes, it really helps clarify handling of uh, exiting out of workflow state uh, tasks, et cetera. Uh, infinite tokens were added into Sledgehammer so that uh, Sledgehammer itself is a much more usable platform for long lived things like crib. So crib may be running in Sledgehammer in memory instance only, and we need to be able to continuously manipulate and pass workflow down to uh, Sledgehammer itself as one of the use cases. Um, what else? Reorder, Sledgehammer, enhanced disk erase support, extra packages was added. Uh, that's not very big. Rose, so Rose is sort of a, um, uh, demonstration workflow that allows uh, DevStack deployment of OpenStack. Um, it's as Rob is typing now, use with caution, it has lots of sharp edges um, and it's relatively limited support use case, support, supported environment. 
Uh, we also added a custom iPixie boot environment, which allows you to bring your own custom bootloader. We've had a couple of use cases for that in uh, community, I think. Uh, one of the big features, uh, Sledgehammer got a significant uplift in the year. Uh, we switched to Sledgehammer Builder itself, so now we're actually building Sledgehammer as a workflow component. Uh, full IPv6 support, multi-OS and multi-arch support. Uh, so Sledgehammer ARM64 added, as well as AMD64. Uh, um, IPv6 full support I mentioned in there as well. Uh, we did not get DHCP v6 in this year, though. I don't think we talked about it a lot, but I don't think oh, that got right. in this year. And that should, that should add that to the roadmap. It's not that should go point. under roadmap, yeah, yeah okay. uh, to fully enabled uh, v6 stack. At the, the current moment, uh, DRP and Sledgehammer do fully support IPv6 and all things except the DHCP service. So DHCP itself is only IPv4. Uh, so if you needed to do a DHCP with, in conjunction with DRP, you need to use an external V6 capable DHCP service. Uh, there were a number of tweaks in workflow to pass in kernel options to uh, get the sledgehammer to do interesting things like uh, wait times for uh, environments that are, are using switch, um, uh, not fast boot, no, I just blocked on the name. Greg, help me out. You added this. Port fast. Fast boot? Port Switch. Fast. Port fast, thank you. <laughs> I had something right in there. Um, port fast on switches. So some, some environments have their switches to set to blocking mode when they're first enabled to prevent uh, spanning tree loop problems. And then that causes boot issues with DHCP. If DHCP fires off prior uh, uh, to port fast opening the port up, uh, so this allows you to control the timers, among a few other things there. Uh, core OS was added, and then two of the major components that just came in, uh, which I think you're going to see a significant impact going into 2019, uh, mentioned briefly, joinup.shell. Uh, has We started playing around with a lot of extended capabilities with that, uh, from enrolling uh, brownfield machines to enrolling containers, virtual machines, switches as objects, etc., so we're starting to see some really interesting patterns around that that came in at the end of this year. And then just recently, um, we had our community member, Maz, uh, finished his real-world implementation of Cumulus uh, zero-touch provisioning switching switch support, uh, which was used in conjunction, and Greg has been working with him significantly with the joinup.shell process and uh, prototyping all of that work to make that happen. So you'll start to see a significant enhancement and capabilities in DRP and switch environments. Uh, interesting things to come from there. Uh, and then there were lots of point release upgrades to boot environments, CentOS, Red Hat, Debian, Ubuntu, et cetera, et cetera. We added CoreOS, et cetera. Whew, I'm out of breath. That's a lot. All right, so, and that's um, sort of the major strokes. There are a lot of little things here and there that I, I didn't think were necessary to put in. Uh, there are probably some things that may not have necessarily needed to make this list, but there's a lot of really good foundational stuff, like I said, first half of the year and a lot of acceleration on top of those capabilities the second half of this year. And then I'm gonna hand over to Rob if you want to take over and do 2019 roadmap stuff. I'm happy to, let me share my screen. Oops, that's the right button. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, I'm not ready to publish. Uh, this is a document yet, but um, I was just making changes to the spreadsheet behind the scenes, but I'm happy to discuss it. So it's effectively public, but not, we're not posting it like in the docs or anything yet. Um, and I'll, I'll go, so a lot of this ends up being the way we think about roadmap versus, you know, commitments to what's in the roadmap. I, I, I'd have, looking back on 2018, um, about half the work that ended up being major features that we're really excited about weren't on our roadmap list at all. As a matter of fact, the, the tracking doc I have kept the 2018 things. It's an interesting to see what, what low items came up and what high items never got built. Um, so that's what this highlight, I just said what our highlighted, this highlighted section is. Um, and it, what, I, what I like to do, just as a way to think about how we look at digital rebar 
is there's, there's four directions that we build things in, up and down, in and out. Um, Greg, I, I changed in and down since you saw this because uh, it made more sense to me to change it. And if it doesn't make sense, then we'll change it back. But, um, so we, we look at, and, and we don't, there isn't one thing that we do or don't do. Um, so we, we work in all four directions sort of simultaneously. Um, some of them are, get more community visibility than others, just because of the, you know, some of them track in proprietary for customers. Um, so the up direction are things where we're building on top of the platform. So Kubernetes is definitely a, a hey, platform. Yeah. Rob, could you what? please zoom your um, oh, screen in so it's a little better and, you know, 75% of it isn't wasted. I know you're a fan of. No, you know, no, I'm glad you, I'm glad you remind me. That's exactly what you, you, I need somebody to do. Is that better? Material design. 90% of your screen should be wasted white space and material design. <laughs> Um, um, sorry, sorry. I'm gonna rib you on personal rant. Yeah, no. I, I, I was gonna tell you it's the Natalie Portman the design. It's uh, the joke. Stop I was it! Make. Don't set me off. <laughs> I'll start strangling myself. Uh, uh, um, so up, down, in, and out. Uh, up are things like API integrations, things that we're building on top. Um, these are, these are examples, some of which we're, we're building towards and, um, some of which aren't, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but those are the, you know, those are things that, that we, we definitely are building up from a top perspective. CMDB would be something like uh, device 42 or NetBox, IPAMs, same, same type of tools. We, we see a couple of different IPAMs, DNS integrations, um, a lot of times these are things that get built really fast, our Ansible tower integration. Um, we prototype and then we, then we roll forward. Um, and then we've been building some newer, newer things, uh, that we were, I think we talked about in demos like agent, um, where things can run all by themselves. Those are the up layer. I expect to see a lot of things built here, uh, in the next year based on what, what we're seeing. It's, uh, a lot of them rely on plugins and so they'll, They'll not necessarily show up in digital rebar proper. They'll show up in our in the rack and libraries. Um, by and large, and I think there's some stuff in the roadmap. Uh, rack, the the things on these peripherals are rack and extensions around digital rebar, um, with the exception of the in stuff. So things that are in digital rebar typically are items where we've made improvements to the system itself. So baseline performance, scale, logging. Um, high availability stuff usually involves plugins or extensions. Um, security, same thing. Um, like we're expecting to do um, LDAP security, so enterprise style delegated authority. Um, it, it won't show up in digital rebar, it'll be an extension. Um, uh, we just added DHCP v6 back in, which probably needs to show up on this list. Um, again, See if, see if the customers who are asking for it still still need it. Um, on the outside, this is stuff that's a little bit more future for us, but it's it's thinking about multiple digital rebar endpoints. So um, multi-tenancy capabilities, building um, synchronization between digital rebar infrastructures. So if you have like a secure limited control span, DM, uh, like a DMZ digital rebar endpoint, being able to have a, a managed control point separate from that. These are some esoteric uh, things that we've, we've started to have help people build. Um, star and spoke, so having a, a master digital rebar and synchronizing into a whole bunch of edges um, and then edge management. So if you're, if you're thinking about this type of problem space with digital rebar, call us. We are building things here um, that we can either collaborate with you on or um, sell you. It's, this is, this to us is a, a, the, the, the out, out and up are major, actually all these areas are, are areas where there's commercial value. Um, the downside are things where we're look, going to a layer below us in the infrastructure. And those are things like more hardware support. So we're, we're adding more hardware. 
we're adding uh, the switch stuff is coming along very nicely. Uh, you can see things surfacing in community. We expect uh, that to continue to move faster um, based on some of the engagements we're starting to see. So um, those are the areas where digital rebar is going to keep going. I, you know, I know we're going to keep improving digital rebar open source pieces, um, and we're that's going to that's going to be pulled along. I, but I don't think there's a lot of feature set that's missing. So we'll continue to improve it. You know, the in side will go really far, but everything else around it is likely add-ons and extensions that that we're going to Racken's going to be building up around to support what what customer needs are. So that's sort of the 2019 where I expect to see our focus is going to be 80% on the up, down, and outs. Um, less, less time spent on the ins, um, except for you know, hardening and, and enhancements. And I think, Shannon, thinking back to your list, um, thinking back to your list, I think that that reinforces what we've been seeing over time. We, we, we go through cycles where we add a whole bunch of things around. Some of the digital rebar gets pulled forward, but um, I would expect to see some some stabilization pieces, and that's this is our exactly. this is our whole strategy, right? Where we don't maintain a different digital rebar for customers. There's only one digital rebar, but there's a lot of things that we do um, around by design that we do around digital rebar to make it a product as opposed to a project. Um, and so that that lines up with with this, where this sort of shows all the things. All the blue is is rack end pieces. The green are the open pieces. Um, and you can see as some of the Upstack integrations we're doing, like crib or open. A lot of the content that we maintain, especially for open operating systems, are are public. Um, and then you know there's a lot of things that we've been adding that are rack end. And it's it's worth noting that just because something's rack end doesn't mean it's not available. We have a ton of, of features like the task library that are available uh, for community users um, and just and the UX and things like that. It's it's a some of the, a lot of it's maintained as rack end IP, not just Apache open IP. Um, and then in, so boy, we're, we're looking, 2019 is gonna have a ton of enterprise uh, work, more hardware support, um, pooling self-service stuff, we're already seeing really uh, good interest in and that'll keep coming along. We'll build some more support around that. Multi-site synchronization's a big deal coming up. LDAP mm -hmm. integration's a big deal. Um, I called out ServiceNow ticket integration. Um, I don't know that we need service now specifically, but that type of, it's more of a reference type of thing. Um, it very well likely will be service now. But, um, and then we expect the Kubernetes stuff to keep going. Ansible Tower, which we, we did, we're gonna be testing considerably. So I expect these are more in sustaining mode. Um, IPAM integrations, I, I, I suspect we're gonna start formalizing some um, we see that in, in community, we see that in enterprise, CMDV integrations. There's a ton of them uh, that we've been sort of tracking, but nothing has been productized. So I'd like to see us figure that out or figure out if there's CMDV needs that are not met by Netbox or Device42, um, like history, legacy, uh, compliance reporting, things like that. So um, I think there's opportunity there. I, I, I actually think that's a second half of the year type of thing. And DNS keeps, on my radar, keeps popping up um, as something people need, but we haven't provided any reference examples for it. Um, but there's really nothing stopping anyone from integrating their own DNS environment. It's just, it's a workflow piece, really. That, um, I think or, some people just need or a plug guidance. Or a plug-in, yeah. I, I don't, I'd love yeah, to get feet. This, the, these are places where I'm like, I, I, I know that we need this because when people bring machines on, they, they need to put the names in. Um, and Create so, and destroy operations to hook into DNS appropriately. And, and right. I so so the, the, we all have implications in that as well. Yeah, this is actually a subtopic. Systems of record integration is, is the, the way this I, it probably should be structured is um, like that. Just a quick heads up, five minutes. I'm Thank you. Um, 
then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go into the, I'm not going to scroll down into this, the detailed version. I'm just going to talk about, about this. And then we should probably have a whole section in the meeting about compatibility expectations. Um, I started to document something. Um, and then the other, the other major topic that you see in community and we're excited about um, is starting to do convert, what I would call converged infrastructure um, software software converged infrastructure. And so in those cases, we're doing things that bring physical, you know, compute network and storage together um, or vCenter like, the, you know, platform integrations. Um, you could actually put the Kubernetes machine controller in this and all of those um, based on conversations we've had in community and the customers are, are going to be priority uh, deliverables. And I frankly, I'm really excited about that. This is, this is where digital rebar design is is meant to go is this this is the the why we built things the way we built it not just to replace cobbler really well it's to do this um so i'm excited about seeing that that coming for next year um and then we we talked about release strategy it's um we we try to release by features so things come quickly uh, if you go back to what Shane did for the first half of this meeting, you'll you'll think you'll see that there's buckets of features that we say this is enough, and then get it out. And then it, a lot of times we do a two release cycle, so um, something is more preliminary, and then it surfaces in the next release. Um, that's pretty typical. And then if you're if you're watching this and you haven't looked at how we use feature flags, please please do that, um, Shane. In, in the way you did the release those notes, because we don't. We don't quite track it this way. A lot of the features are actually flagged features that um, got bundled into a release. And so um, we really try and rely on the flag to determine when features are, when features are in, not on release numbers. Um, so you, if you ask the rack end team, which release came, did this feature come in? I'll, I'll, we don't track it like that. We, we really track it on a feature or feature flag basis. Um, which is important because we don't want to have, we don't want releases to become tie points uh, for that. And then, yep, okay. And then uh, we'll have to talk about compatibility as a whole nother thing. We work really hard to maintain backwards compatibility, but there's expectations that if you're using a fresh DRP, tip DRP, you're gonna be using D, uh, DRP content. Greg, am I saying that in the right direction? That's where I get confused. Or which one? If I'm if I'm using a new endpoint, I'm going to be using new content. Uh, we we yes. try to make it so content can go backwards, but not endpoints. Um, or I don't know what we try and do. <laughs> it's In general, it's, we try and let you keep reusing content as you roll forward the DRP, so that you don't have to immediately update if you don't want to. There's some notable changes in this recent one that caused us to need to do that. Well, it kind of works, but it's better if you just update around the multi art support. It, it's super hard to keep the content um, legacy, uh, legacy content from breaking. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really hard. API compatibility, I think we do a really good job on but content gets is hard. There are a lot of interdependencies there. So basically roll your DRP forward, roll your content forward. <laughs> You'll be okay then. Yeah. Yeah. Or, te or, and test. But, well, always test. Yes. I thought that was a silent implied. It, it is. I, I would love for us to build, uh, build up a bigger uh, automated test, um, where we were testing legacy and cross version checks and things like that. It's on my, it's on my backlog. All right. That, so right that's a kind of a wrap for things today. Um, we see, we see, we have some uh, community members that snuck here in here somewhere at the end. Uh, welcome, uh, rather belatedly, but welcome. Uh, and we're going to say goodbye unless there are any specific community questions in the last minute you'd like to lob at us. Um, Chris, Bo, uh, Bastian, uh, et cetera, if you have anything you wanted to ask, fire away. 
going once, going twice fast. Not, yeah, but, not a question, but a comment. So thanks for the great product and support from the community channel. So we definitely benefit from many features from DRP, um, especially the content and the uh, like uh, seamless uh, legacy UEI5 Pixie boot. So those are great features. We yeah, we definitely appreciate um, the product and your team. So good luck for the new year. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. More customers will always ensure we can continue providing awesome things. It's all I'll say for a sales pitch. <laughs> Just help when people pay for things. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Bo. We do appreciate it. And the, the positive feedback is um, definitely warmly um, felt on our side. So uh, next meetup will be not the first of the year, which is two weeks from now, but will probably be the, what, the seventh, uh, the first, second you January. Just push, you're second just pushing January. back a week. You want to push back? Yeah, well, yeah, well we're not going to meet up on New Year's Day. So right. uh, we'll push the meetup back. So it'll be three weeks until the next meetup. We'll see you for V032 in 2019. Until then, everyone, uh, whatever holidays you choose to celebrate, uh, enjoy and be safe out there. And we'll see you next year. That's a wrap. Thanks, Shane. See ya. Thank you. Bye.